This is a case that I saw a few weeks ago at the Greenbelt office. It's a 66 year old male presents with bilateral, bilateral stabbing and aching pain, edema, skin changes, uh, and he had an active ulcer on the lateral left lower extremity. He also reported a right medial malleolus ulcer that healed approximately three weeks ago. Uh, he was previously seen in 2014 at the Greenbelt office and treatment was recommended at that time. However, the patient chose not to go through with treatment. Uh, his symptoms are aggravated by prolonged standing. Uh, he typically takes Tylenol for pain and uses compression stockings regularly. And he has been using them for uh, many years at this point, 20 to 30. He has a history of osteoarthritis, sickle cell anemia, atrial fibrillation, and chronic venous insufficiency. He did have a right lower extremity DVT in 2021 while he was on Coumadin. Uh, he was subsequently switched to Eliquis uh, by his hematologist. Uh, he had a DVT in the right upper extremity uh, twice back in 2000. After his uh, first DVT in the right upper extremity, he was uh, hospitalized, uh, put on Coumadin. Nine months later, he ended up uh, being taken off the Coumadin. And then shortly after he was taken off, he had a recurrence of DVT. He's got no prior arterial history. He's got no prior venous procedures. Uh, and his surgical history was only significant for a cholecystectomy. He is a prior smoker. He used to smoke more than one pack per day and he quit 15 years ago. Uh, occasional alcohol use and he's got no significant family history for DVT, chronic renaissance insufficiency. Medications that he's on are Eliquis, he's on hydroxyurea, Ritacrit, metoprolol, vitamin D and folic acid. And so this is his uh, physical exam. Vitals were normal. He's got a BMI of 24, height is six, his weight's 180. Uh, dermatologically, his skin, he's got a healed ulcer uh, in the right lower extremity, just above the medial malleolus. Uh, that's right here. And then on the left lateral malleolus, he had an active ulcer. Uh, it's not the best angle on that picture, but you can see there's some breakdown of the skin here. Um, he did have diminished pedal DP and PT pulses, two out of four, the SEPA five on the right and the SEPA six on the left. And uh, he has some edema as well. So these were his ultrasound findings. Uh, he's got bilateral GSV reflex, pretty much junction of distal calf on the right leg, junction to mid calf on the left leg. And he has SSV reflex on the left leg as well. Uh, he's got a perforator at the medial distal calf on the right leg. And um, if you look at, look at the deep system, he did have that DVT uh, in 2021. So there's p -throm in the pretty much from the common femoral vein down to the popliteal. So we initially, this was the initial treatment plan was to do a radio frequency ablation of the left GSV junction to mid calf, uh, RF of the right GSV junction to distal calf. And we also did a referral to CVM uh, to, to assess for any arterial disease. And this was kind of before we, we spoke to him quite a bit about his history with sickle cell. He had been on hydroxyurea for quite some time now, many years. Um, previously, he had had uh, hospitalizations, um, you know, acute, acute pain crises. He never had acute chest syndrome, but he uh, did have multiple occasions where he he had these pain crises due to a sickle cell. So that's why he was put on long-term hydroxyurea. So I kind of, this kind of worked out perfectly based on our email thread. I kind of want to discuss uh, sickle cell disease and uh, the development of leg ulcers in this population. So the leg ulcers are a pretty frequent complication of sickle cell disease patients, particularly if they have the SS genotype. 
Um, with the SS genotype, they're the most likely to develop leg ulcers. Um, prevalence varies widely amongst different populations. Uh, there's 75% in the Jamaican population versus 1% of Saudi Arabia and Asian populations. And the large uh, you know, gap in this percentage is uh, due to some of the studies uh, having uh, very like skewed populations where they would uh, treat or they would uh, look at patients that were just under 20 or the majority of the patients were under 30 years old. There was a co cooperative study of sickle cell disease in the United States. This was a study in 2016 that indicated an overall prevalence of 2.5% in persons under 10 years and older. Um, but however, in this study, 70% of the study, uh, the patients were uh, less than 30 years old. Um, given the improved survival of sickle cell disease patients now, prevalence is likely to be much higher. And more recent data shows that uh, prevalence of 14.5% 14, 14 in the United States. So when it comes to ulcers in this population, they typically occur in the second decade of life, and they continue to increase in frequency after the third decade of life. And the most common uh, genotypes of sickle cell are the ESS and the SS alpha thalassemia genotypes. These are the most likely to develop leg ulcers in their lifetime. And data from the 2016 study indicates that higher hemoglobin and uh, fetal hemoglobin levels are protective against ulcers, especially in these two uh, genotypes. But with the alpha thalassemia, uh, it wasn't the overall hemoglobin uh, higher hemoglobin, it was more had to do with the fetal hemoglobin levels versus just having a higher hemoglobin level. So the pathogenesis is uh, multifactorial, of course, with sickle cell, uh, you have chronic anemia with hemolysis, um, nitric oxide uh, gets taken up and these patients have uh, much less nitric oxide, which leads to more inflammation, endothelial damage, microvascular disease, um, leads to skin breakdown. These patients end up having a lot of neuropathy as well. Uh, muscle atrophy, which decreases uh, their calf muscle pump function, uh, which can also uh, lead to venous insufficiency. Uh, these patients end up having a, a lot of uh, bacterial colonization uh, locally around their where their skin breaks down. And um, there's evidence of like these patients having more DBT uh, and, you know, poor nutrition, low BMI and poor socioeconomic status all plays a role in um, the development of ulcers in these patients. Uh, with these ulcers, about 50% occurs secondary to trauma and the location of these ulcers are usually at the medial and lateral malleolus, but can also occur on the dorsum of the foot or the anterior shin. And um, the reason why the malle malleoli are kind of more affected um, due to the marginal blood flow at the site, high venous pressure, thin skin, uh, most of these patients have uh, edema as well uh, before their uh, ulcers develop. And this is a picture of a uh, sickle cell ulcer. And the appearance of it, they usually have a punched out appearance uh, with well-defined margins, slightly raised edges. Uh, and the base of the ulcer usually comprises of granulation tissue, often covered by like, uh, yellow slough. Uh, and more than half of the patients will have more than two ulcers that are present at the same time. And then multiple small ulcers may coalesce to form a larger ulcer. And another point for these uh, for this population is a lot of these patients get put on hydroxyurea, uh, which is supposed to increase their fetal hemoglobin levels. And this medication has been shown to decrease hospitalizations, acute chest syndrome, blood transfusion, and pain crises. Uh, for sickle cell patients. Now, this medication has been linked to development of ulcers. Uh, 
but there is insufficient data to prove whether hydroxyurea truly promotes wound healing or actually leads to ulcers. It's supposed to increase the fetal hemoglobin levels, which is supposed to be protective against uh, the development of the ulcers in the first place. But however, there have been many cases where patients have been put on high dose hydroxyurea and then they end up developing these ulcers. And once the hydroxyurea is discontinued, these ulcers resolve. So the picture on the right here is uh, hydroxyurea induce ulcer, and this is eight weeks after, the bottom picture is eight weeks after they discontinued the medication. And the reason why this happens due to this medication is not completely clear, but could be due to cumulative toxicity in the basal layer of the epidermis uh, through inhibition of DNA synthesis. So when it comes to venous insufficiency and the link to sickle cell leg ulcers. Um, different cohorts have shown the higher prevalence of venous insufficiency in patients with these uh, sickle cell leg ulcers. Edema is typically associated uh, with these ulcers as well. Um, at this time, compression is recommended to reduce the edema. Uh, and venous ablations have been proposed to improve healing and reduce reoccurrence of these ulcers. This hasn't specifically been studied. Uh, in this population. Uh, so there's no real evidence that venous ablations are superior to compression um, in these patients either. So the overall treatment of these ulcers is topical treatment, wound care, wound, wound cleansing, pain management, proper nutrition, proper application of compression and dressings. There's hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, so there's many different ways to treat these ulcers, uh, but it hasn't been completely proven that doing a venous ablation, if the, person, if the patient ended up having uh, venous insufficiency, uh, would change anything. So when we're looking at this patient, his, his ulcers on the left lateral malleolus, he did have GSV and SSV reflux uh, in the left lower extremity. So kind of some of the questions that uh, Dr. Sawa and I had uh, when we were uh, approaching this patient was, will avoiding the left GSV benefit this patient overall? Um, the patient is on hydroxyurea. He has been on it for a long term. Um, it's not necessarily a very, very high dose, but um, are these ulcers secondary to the medication that he's taken? And do we, we speak with hematology for possible discontinuation? The other thing that we kind of uh, thought about is that though he does have an active ulcer on the, uh, by his left ankle, he didn't mention that his right ankle medial malleolus, he had an ulcer there and it healed three weeks ago. So he hadn't discontinued the hydroxyurea. So, um, you know, are these medication induced or not? And on the right side, uh, he had the healed ulcer, but he also has P thrombo of the deep system on the right side from his DDT from one year ago. He's on Eliquis right now. Um, is his superficial system acting as a collateral in the right leg? And does the right lower extremity need to be treated um, in this setting with uh, the P thrombo that he has in the deep system? So these were the sources uh, that I use uh, for this presentation. And let me stop sharing for a second, but kind of just wanted to present this case. I know we had an email thread about it the other day, but wanted to get uh, different opinions here. What'd be the best way to go about doing it? Um, he does have the active ulcer, likely secondary to uh, it's the ulcer looks like it's from his sickle cell disease. The venous insufficiency isn't um, really helping anything, but is treating the GSV, SSV um, in this case going to be beneficial or not? There's not really too much evidence saying that it would definitely help, but um, with the edema that he's having, you know, we can fix some of the venous insufficiency would that be beneficial in this case?
So that's kind of the case that I wanted to present and wanted to see if anybody had any thoughts. Yes, yeah, so, so this is a difficult case because it's a mixed ideology, right? Yeah. So he's presenting like a typical, you know, venous insufficiency patient with all the signs and symptoms of bilateral GSV and SSV reflux. But he also, on top of it, has the complication of his active sickle cell disease with a known drug that appease wound healing, right? We know from Dr. Diol's emails that hydroxyurea has a significant impact on wound healing. So this is one of those where you have to kind of eliminate variables and, and treat them one at a time. So me personally, I would just treat him like a regular venous insufficiency patient to begin with, and then only worry about the other extraneous factors if he showed evidence of non-healing. You know, so the one thing that you didn't put in your presentation, and I don't know if there's any data on this, but let's say that you did treat him with all your uh, venous therapies and he had a retractable ulcer and you sent him to your hematology colleagues and they said, well, there's a high level of fetal hemoglobin in this patient. Would he benefit from a transfusion to get rid of the fetal hemoglobin in order to promote wound healing? Is there any data to support that? Yeah, I'm not sure of the data, but yeah, I mean, I guess if you did your venous interventions and then, you know, he's still not healing, I think that would be a good idea to speak with the hematologist to see if doing a blood transfusion after doing the... Yeah, when I, when I was younger and I started working at the VA as one of my first jobs, I had several sickle cell Vietnam War vets who had, who had ulcers and we got them to the point where we had treated all their, their vein problems. And the only thing that was still outstanding was that they, um, they had a high level fetal hemoglobin rate. And it wasn't until we actually had them transfused out because they were stalled for a while and then they, they weren't re-epithelializing that they yeah. started to then heal again. But um, I'm, I actually was, while you were doing your presentation, pull out an old textbook of mine to try to see where I got that information. But I don't, I don't, I can't recall a reference that, that proves that to be true. Okay. So anybody else in the audience have any experience treating some of these sickle cell patients? So, you know, the other part of this, I think, which is important is uh, not all ulcers are venous related. So another uh, group of ulcers, we call them venous mimics that are also very common are these rheumatologic ulcers. So yes. at some point in your career, you're going to get a patient who's got like rheumatoid arthritis or rheumatoid disease that also presents with the wound. And in this instance, my experience has been exactly the opposite. So they're usually on methotrexate or some other kind of um, medication to treat the rheumatoid disease. When they come off of it, their ulcers get worse because their, their, anti, their autoimmune disorders are not uh, uh, under control anymore. And yeah. somehow, for some reason, that leads to the continued deterioration of the wound. When they get back on their medication, then the wound starts to heal again. So, so they, they behave very differently. Also, the appearance is very different. These rheumatologic ulcers are very like beefy red. They've got like awesome granulation tissue. And you would yeah. say to yourself, well, if anybody's going to heal, it's going to be this one. And these are the ones that tend to stall sometimes. So you have to be careful for these venous mimics. Another thing that looks like a venous ulcer, which is making a comeback, especially during the 90s when age has started to pop up. <laughs> Is, uh, tuber is tuberculosis. Remember to bring your library books. Remember your library books. Okay. Go back to the library and then you have to give this. So, the so back on Monday, okay? Peter. Um, yeah, okay. So, you know, there's, there's two things that I heard. <laughs> oh, whoever that is. Could, they, could, could you guys That's mute school? the phone, please, for a second? We'll give it to Miss Berge. Let her put it in the Bob, chat, okay? Can you mute your, your mic, Bob? Thank you. So, so there's two things that I heard that, that I think is really important here. So first thing is, Peter, the fact that you said, hey, um, you would treat the venous insufficiency and then let it play out whether or not the wound heals. A lot of times when we see something like this, we don't, we're very conservative in terms of how to manage this. It would be much different if this guy came and has had an ulcer for one month and we just go all out and treat all, his, all of his uh, venous insufficiency. But this guy has been dealing th with this for years. Yeah. And we are, we're his, we're his, you know, he's probably seen like 10 different doctors at this point. 
and and we're we're his shot, you know. And so ultimately, a lot of times, um, I tell my patients that, look, ultimately, the venous insufficiency may not be the 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 first cause of this ulcer. However, it's a promoting cause of the ulcer um, uh, not to heal. So if we can somehow improve the overall health of the leg and improve the overall, you know, um, uh, uh, delivery of oxygen, the, the decrease of the swelling, all of that will actually promote the healing and the health of the leg. And hopefully we'll get this thing to heal along with getting your hematologist to adjust your medication along with uh, wound care. So that's, that's, so that's, that's the, 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 the takeaway point for me for this, right? A lot of times we just can't fix the direct problem, but we can improve the overall health of the leg. Second part is that um, I, I think that giving a blood transfusion is a very reasonable thing to do, especially again, you're just going to, you know, this guy's been dealing with this for years. I think that anytime you can uh, improve his overall delivery of oxygenation to the, to the wound, uh, that's going to help. The only issue with that is that I think you're going to have to wind up giving him lots of blood transfusions because obviously um, with his sickle cell, he's going to break down these cells and he's going to, he's going to become anemic again. Do, do, uh, just out of curiosity, do you know what his baseline hemoglobin is, Sager? Uh, when we, when I spoke to him, he said his, I don't know what exactly his baseline was, but his most recent uh, CBC, I believe his hemoglobin was around 10. Oh, that's actually not too bad. Yeah, yeah, that's so, actually not too bad. For him, so yes. I, I was thinking, you know, sometimes we see these guys at like six or seven, yeah. and you know, at six or seven, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to heal because you just can't get enough oxygenation to the to the wound. But at ten, I mean, that's actually not not horrible. And I'm, you know, I, I, obviously, I think that's a good point that you can still give them a blood transfusion to see if it helps. But um, you know, ten is actually not not horrific by any means. Yeah, and Sager also, I think another variable to discuss here is you clearly uh, outlined that he had a previous history of a DVT in that leg. And the duplex scan showed that he had evidence of post-thrombotic vein damage as well. Yeah. So a component of his venous ulceration is probably related to his post-thrombotic dis disease as well. So he's got a lot of factors going on in his life. And the reason why that's important is during your preoperative discussion with him, you need to outline what these factors are. And you need to tell them that you're going to try to address these in a stepwise progression, but that leg is never going to be normal because of his post-thrombotic disease. And then unless he does prophylactic measures like wear his compression stocking, make sure that he maintains his hemoglobin, doesn't, doesn't become morbidly obese, he's going to have a history of multiple recurrences of these, of these wounds on his leg. So, so you know, education is a big part of this with this guy because he's going to be one of these chronic patients that you're going to have in your practice forever. Yeah. And in his case, he was, he was a pretty healthy guy. I mean, he, he would work out a lot despite, you know, having to deal with these ulcers for uh, many years at this point. Um, and he seemed like he's pretty uh, on top of staying up with his doctors in terms of the sickle cell disease and all of that when we spoke to him. So. Yeah. But like to Dr. Nguyen's point though, he has post-thrombotic disease and you don't know, has anybody sat him down and educated him and told him, I said, look, you've had a previous ulcer, but this is why I'm sorry, you've had a previous blood clot, but this is why previous blood clots are dangerous because you get these recurrent wounds and patients don't know that. Yeah. So I, I don't want to minimize that fact because you can treat a superficial disease, but what's going to get him in the long term is going to be his post-thrombotic syndrome and his chronic and you know, the chronicity of his venous hypertension. So along with, and then the sickle cell is just another complicating factor in his overall health. Yeah. All right, does anybody else have any questions for us, Dr. Patel? So if not, I would, I wanna congratulate Sagar. This is his last grand round. Sagar has now officially completed the fellowship. He is going to be uh, graduating within the next week or so. So I wanna say thank you, Sagar, for, for um, you know, doing the fellowship and taking advantage of it. It's been a pleasure teaching you. And uh, remember, you never, you never go away. You're always part of the CBR family, no matter where you are. And so it's been a pleasure, Sager. Uh, Sager, uh, yeah, so, so I, I wanna say just a couple of words here as well. So Sager's trained under, under me for a lot of, uh, uh, at Glen Burnie, and I'll tell you that uh, Sager has made just tremendous uh, progress over the course of the last year and uh you know really proud to 
to be able to talk, to call Sager a, a colleague and a, and a vain professional. And uh, thank you, Sager. But just like what Peter said is uh, thank you for trusting us with your, with your education and, and for all of the effort that you put into becoming uh, a, a great um, vain, vain professional. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. Dr. Pappas, thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Nguyen, Dr. Fernandez, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Jump, and Dr. Sawa were uh, the doctors who trained me uh, during the fellowship. I can't say enough good things about the fellowship. I'd recommend it to anybody who is uh, interested in this field. And uh, I feel lucky to be uh, a part of CVR for the past year and learning from all of you. And uh, so I appreciate everything. Thank you. Yeah, and don't forget Dr. Camarada. And Dr. Camarada. There you course. go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Sagar. Everybody have a great weekend.